where our ideology around nonviolent resistance is tethered directly to what it means to seek justice for the right. oppressed. I'm Joyce. And I'm Jess. And this is the Down to Earth Podcast. Today we are talking about nonviolent resistance. And I think we're talking about this as a way of confronting power. This whole season is uh, being curated around the idea of power and authority. And I think for us to talk about power and authority, we cannot skip the concept of non-violent resistance. Sure, yeah, pacifism has to be right here at the start of the season on power. And because pacifism or non-violent resistance as a form of activism is in a sense another form of power. It's leveraging power in a different way against maybe the wrong use of power. Mm -hmm. So we want to explore that today. And I think sometimes when we hear the word path pacifism, which I can barely say, <laughs> I think when we hear it, we think of that as a fringe group of people who are pacifists and I, I, I don't know, live in a commune or... I, 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 I right. don't think we think of it as a mainstream way right of or being. it's a uh, old idea like i think of it maybe maybe it's because right now when we're recording this episode we're coming up to remembrance day mm -hmm. and so i think of it tied to the war world war ii and people who protested um going to war or maybe later when you think about like the vietnam war or something and people like fled into canada like a like 60s concept, dodging. like a very strong 60s right. concept, the Beatles. Yeah, uh, beatnik that kind yeah. of culture. Mm -hmm. Or um, like you said, some kind of you belong to maybe Mennonite culture or you belong to some particular sect of a religious ideology that makes you believe in pacifism. And so lots of us haven't ever really thought about it unless we come from those traditions. Um, we just, we know it historically or we know it abstractly. Yeah, and I think uh, what we want to do today is actually explore this concept. In no way, I don't think either of us are saying that this is the only way, but I do believe it is a concept that we actually have to look at and we have to um, consider it based on the words that Jesus said in the Gospels and how, and how the Bible talks sure. to these kinds of issues. Yeah, and again, we don't, uh, just to be clear, like, we're not doing an episode on just war theory or we're not talking about the violence of God. We're talking about pacifism and nonviolent resistance. So yes. some of those conversations are, you know, as listening people might be like, yeah, but what about X, Y, or Z? So today we're going to highlight areas in the biblical text that demonstrate pacifism has a very long biblical history, but we're not co contrasting it in this particular episode with violence and answering those kinds of questions. So just saying that at the outset, because otherwise I could hear people kind of writing in and be, yeah, but what about, um, this is particularly doing a deep dive on right. pacifism. And I think what we're saying is it is one way to confront yeah, power. Uh, power. And we must wrestle with it. If we say we're followers of Jesus, theologically, the, the idea of some of what he brings out, particularly in the Beatitudes or in um, the Sermon on the Mount, we've got to wrestle with how do we do that in real time, not just abstractly, some special people, but real followers of Christ? Mm -hmm. So way back, like, what's the earliest story you can think of in the biblical text where you see some violence um, and maybe a... Is this a, a quiz? Well, I'm just a Bible quiz. Bible quiz. Joyce I was bringing back <laughs> Bible quiz right now. I was a Bible quiz champion. I was just like, I you was know. too. It's a good thing we didn't live in the same province. I would have kicked it's your just, butt. We did names. live in the same province. It's just I'm older than you. So she is we wouldn't have competed. way older than me. I would like to say this is just for the record. I just like to talk about this. Okay. It has nothing to do Put with it pacifism. Out there. Yeah. My daughter, my <laughs> six year old daughter, said to me this summer, Well, mom, you're way older than Miss Joyce. And I laughed and high-fived her because everybody mm -hmm. always thinks I'm way older than Jess because you just have a youthful appearance. But <laughs> in any case, even Please with keep writing. My... Can you all write in and tell me that I have a youthful appearance? Well, because Eden asked me the other day, what are those brown things around your eyes, Mom? 
They're but called she, bags, even, because I have four <laughs> children, and I don't sleep, and I haven't slept yep. for almost... But even with my mega gray hair, she thought I was younger, so I just like to say that's awesome sauce, and I am only... Please send me free... Five years older Please than you, send me so. samples of But we didn't creams. do Bible quizzes together. This no. is the point. Oh, sorry. We did not do Bible quizzes together, but I'm bringing the Bible quiz back. Okay, so the first... Obviously, it's obvious that the very first... Um, Violent mention narrative. of violence in the Bible was Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, antithesis, really, of pacifism, so to speak, nonviolent right. resistance. Although, in some ways, Cain wasn't really even resisting Abel. But I think, but I think it is. It does show us the need for nonviolence. Yeah, in this text. because they start with this ugly narrative right in the beginning. And violence seems to beget violence. Like we just have this one after the other stories of the way things didn't go well when you like kind of track through the book of Genesis. And, and I think even in human experience, we know that violence is our default setting yep. in some ways. I can never believe when people are like, and humans are basically born perfect or... Because I think clearly people who say that never had children. Right. Because the first thing that your children are going to do is smack each other. <laughs> you don't have to teach them, like, would you, I'm going to teach you now how to pinch people. Like, they just inbred know how to do those things. Yeah. Well, and it's the self. It's looking out for the rights of the self, even with a toddler. Right. That um, kind of gets that violent response. But then you get to texts that are kind of interesting, like the Joshua um a story. I mean, there is obviously violence in the conquest of Canaan, but there's also this letting God be powerful. Mm -hmm. So you see that when the walls of Jericho come falling down, like they didn't do anything except walk right, and, and then worship. blow some kind of trumpets and cheer and walls fell down. So there's something about the power of God acting on their behalf. And I think we unpacked that a little bit, maybe in season one, or maybe that was more more recently, I can't even remember, but um, when we talk about the Exodus narrative, like part of the big important story in the Exodus narrative is that God fights for the people. They don't have to fight for themselves. Right. And so I think when we tie that to the last episode, this idea that God fights for us, then we have to ask ourselves the question, what is our part sure. to play? And I think this is where oftentimes the idea of pacifism is what God is asking us to do. So right. you see this in then in the gospel narratives where Jesus is saying, if if you get smacked upside the head, turn the other cheek. Right. And and love your enemies. Right. And this has become uh, basically euphemistic in our culture. Right. It, but sometimes cliches stop meaning anything. And I think what we have to do is actually stop ourselves and say, okay, so Jesus said these things. Yeah. The texts actually say these things. What? How does this translate to my sure. everyday life? Yeah, what does it look like in real time? And I think the question we ask then is, why has there been such a long history of pacifism? And I think partly that's because it works, right? I think there is this There's idea been... that, um, that if we um, act collectively or individually and then collectively, that we can actually make change. And we've seen this in society in many different ways. Um, in many different eras and yeah. over many different issues. Sure. It's been quite um, telling. Now we look back and we have some overt stories that we know were hinge moments in history that were based on nonviolent resistance. Right. And part of the reason I think we react, especially in this culture, to um, uh, we have a visceral reaction against pacifism, I think, is because we are in a microwave culture. So we want mm. everything to happen quickly. Instant. And so pacifism is a, there's a long, it's a long road to change. Mm -hmm. It's not the easy, like, I'll get it done by noon today. Right. And it's got to have some collaborative effect. So one person's nonviolent resistance isn't going to necessarily, like, affect massive global transformation, but collective. So, and we'll talk a bit about that, the individual versus the communal, um, participation but I don't know for me I think I look back and where I started to sort of get this idea about nonviolent resistance and transformation within society the first person that comes to my mind it won't be the first person that comes to you know other people um, is Dorothy Day mm -hmm. um, some of you have never even heard of her she was part of founding the Catholic worker movement um, she was 
perhaps the first person who became an overt advocate for poor workers. Mm -hmm. So our whole understanding of unions and how they function, um, even the women's right to vote, the suffragette era and stuff in the States, she was one of the people who would go to prison um, and serve time in jail, like because she would go and protest and not move. So she had this pacifism, like she would be there, but like they'd have to carry her in, mm. in to get her arrested. She wouldn't walk. She was like, her passivity was extreme in a certain sense. She was very, very bold. And um, sometimes now we think of unions as sort of like anti-Christian or some right. kind and of socialism. Right, and it's because we've conflated capitalism with Christianity. And I actually think this is a very important issue that mm. we have to confront in our own lives. Does our Christianity look like capitalism? And right. are those two things the same, or or are they are there some points that yes point to Christ, and then some points that don't? Right. The problem becomes when capitalism becomes our dogma and our religion, right. and Christianity follows it. So we allow the Christianity that that like on a Venn diagram has intersection with capitalism. Right. But the stuff that doesn't fit within capitalism, we go, ah. Right. We just sort of throw or, or minimize those statements of Jesus. And our Christianity must confront our biases. It must, if we're not feeling uncomfortable, I think, in our thinking and our walk with Jesus, then I, I would suggest that we have often allowed the culture to tell us right. what our Christianity is. Well, we're not is. disciples of the culture. We're disciples right. of Christ. And there is a problem going on, I think, in terms of just general metrics for discipleship. Because a lot of people aren't thinking through, does this fit with what it means to follow Jesus? So like you're saying, capitalism, if the driving value or the measure of success is how much money we make, for instance, um, then we're probably not wrestling with some of what Jesus calls us to in terms of giving our life away or... Right, and I don't think in any way am I saying that any of this is black and white. I don't think it is. I think there's struggle in it, and you got to feel the struggle. If you don't feel a little bit of tension as we talk about this, if you don't read things that Jesus said and feel a wee bit uncomfortable... um, We're probably not taking the text super seriously. Yeah, and we're not wrestling it right. to the ground. Like, so, I, I think you cannot read the Beatitudes and think, oh, yeah, yeah, I got that down. Because <laughs> what does it mean when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers? Right. When, like, I know this because I, uh, like, I know that when uh, America invaded Iraq a number of years ago, people had war parties. Christians had war parties. Right. And if you don't live in these circles, you might be horrified at this moment. But I know that this is true because yeah. I had people and friends that I know ordered pizza right, to, to watch celebrate. America invade, and Canada was part of this as well, invade yeah. another country. Yeah. And I'm not making any kind of judgment as to whether they sh- should have gone or not should have gone. But when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, and there doesn't feel like there's any conflict in your in our minds right. as to how we should, what we should celebrate yeah. and how we should celebrate then we have become just salmon going along the river of society. Culture. Yeah. No, it's a really good point. So coming back to what we were saying about capitalism being equated with being Christian and socialism or communism or some other form of governing systems we equate with maybe being not Christian. Don't write us and tell us we're communists. Yeah, don't. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is this. Dorothy... Day was somebody who found a way of nonviolent resistance as a form of protest, uh, pacifism to confront power inequality, yeah. oppression of the worker, right? So that the worker could be lifted up. Yeah. So amplifying the cry of the poor. If you haven't listened to the justice episodes in season one, you're gonna want to go back and listen to those four episodes. But this is a way where our ideology around nonviolent resistance is tethered directly to what it means to seek justice for the right. oppressed. And then I think you think about big characters who used pacifism as a way to change society. So right. Martin Luther King. Of course. Gandhi. Yeah. Uh, it, and these, this is not an issue of only Christ followers can use pacifism. Right. Because in some ways I think pacifism is a tool that will work for anybody. Right. But then we must realize a tool that works with great cost. 
Yes. Right? So, Borrow Martin Luther King, like, we think of him as iconic, um, setting people free, overturning, um, you know, societal structures and racism, and really making uh, systemic change in the United States and then globally, right? And you think, well, how did they do that? Well, they did things like march across a bridge, mm -hmm. right? Do this long walk. Um, and they were beaten, savagely beaten. Many people yeah. were killed. And then, of course, he was assassinated. So this isn't sort of like, yes, let's just all go for a walk and, right. you know, we'll change the world. It's like, no, you're going to suffer and there's going to be violence against the one who practices right. nonviolent resistance. And I think what we can say, and I think we'll we'll unpack this as the episodes go on, but confrontation of power mm. will always cost us something. Yeah. And so there is a difference, I think, we have to say between pacifism and apathy. Right. Oh, good. Yeah. That's incredibly important because sometimes we think, well, it's not my business, especially Canadians. Yeah. It's not my business, not it. my place. Um Somebody else, you know, probably has more authority with that or right. I'm just going to kind of feel bad about that, but I'm not going to do anything about that. And I think it's very important when we're looking through this whole season. I think we've already talked a little bit about personal power. Like we have a voice. We have a mind. We have a way of leveraging, even in a small aspect, something against what right. is wrong in the world. Right. And I think um, what we're confronted with in the world today is uh, the idea that many of us who are not experiencing any marginalization have gone to sleep. Mm. So we just think to ourselves, well, it was good that Martin Luther King was alive in that day. Good thing we don't have any injustices <laughs> right, right now. Or good thing Dorothy Day started unions. All workers are safe now. Right, which we know full well isn't true. Right. So the question, I think, that that any sort of power or any tool at our disposal to speak to power right. is will we be alive? Will we be, will we be awake to yeah. injustice? Yeah. Well, and I think the idea that it's going to cost us, like it's, it's very interesting who we think of as heroes. Um, and we see some of the wrestle throughout church history of people who were followers of Christ, like some of the examples we've given. And then that led them to, you know, their participation in nonviolent resistance. But you get a guy like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, mm -hmm. who was trying to speak truth to power in the Nazi era, living in Germany as a pastor. And eventually, some of us know, he wrestled this quite significantly and decided that there wasn't, nonviolence wasn't working in his context against Nazis. And for convictions of his own, he decided to participate in an assassination attempt on Hitler. This is a very, if you've never done reading on this, it's a very interesting read because I think it mirrors much of our own wrestle with this kind of idea, with the idea right. of pacifism. I think the thinking around it is so powerful. You, you, um... So you expect Bonhoeffer to be a pacifist except then he's confronted with the Nazi regime and he cannot. Right. Now, we can't pass judgment on that. That's history that's come and gone and- And it's his personal struggle. Right, and in many, you know, then he gets caught and he ends up in a concentration camp and later is hanged. So he didn't um, succeed in his violent resistance. And I think, I think any historian would be able to say that what bon Bonhoeffer's contribution to the world was his pacifism. Yeah. That actually yeah. was his contribution to... And that he spoke truth to power. He used his yes. voice. Without without reverting to violence for a long time. For a very long time. And in some ways, the violence is a footnote in yeah. his life. Yeah, but I think it's an important one for us to realize that we can resonate with that struggle. Because it's easy for us to say violence isn't the way, but it's not as easy when we have to protect our children or having everything threatened, like the, you know, by Boko Haram or some crazy right. thing that's or going like on Right, like the marginalization the of people uh, maybe sometimes requires that we aren't just 
I, it's, yeah, it feels it's like, complex. it feels like I want to say it out loud and then I find it hard to actually say yeah. it out loud. So it, our human inclination is not toward nonviolence. That's like kind of almost going against the grain. Some of that is right and good mm-hmm. um, because we have to protect. And some of it is not good because it's a default setting. We haven't really wrestled with what it means to turn the other cheek, like you said. And I think part of it is our need. Most of us have a strong need to be in control. Mm. And pacifism um, is an Letting action go of that. That, allow, that is saying, I'm going to let God be in control right. and let him change people's hearts. God will act. God will move god is in control and he will answer right so in a sense we're asking for a miraculous intervention not unlike marching around the walls of jericho right if we're going to participate in non-violence as a form of protest right so not apathy but action it's pacifism is an active thing right and i i think in it is an active thing but it does go against the uh, cultural norm of humanism right which equates uh, pacifism sometimes with laziness or stupidity. Right. And humanism is like basically the cultural religion, at least where we live right, right now. So humanism is like, we can do it. We can affect change. We can pull up our bootstraps. We can um, be the answer to the world's problems. This is something different. Um, so it requires this active... It's interesting that the word passive and pacifism, like you can hear the same root... But in fact, they're they're categorically different. They are. Because I think you can be a pacifist in ideology, mm. and that doesn't do a hill of beans of good for the world. Yeah. That, that does nothing for the world. Right. I, I think we actually, what we're actually saying is we must wrestle with pacifism as an action. Right. As activism. And I don't want anybody to hear this and think we're decrying the need for the rule of law. Like, that's not the type of pacifism we're talking about. We're talking about within the constructs. So not anarchy and then some kind of uh, weird protest response. But within the construct of healthy society, there's always going to be a tipping in some way toward injustice. So how do we use our collective power? So there's this is an interesting thing. Um, Good collective pacifism is like Gandhi walking to get salt and all the people walking with him. Mm -hmm. Um, Not everybody, obviously, is a Gandhi or a Martin Luther King, like in terms of world or global impact, historical impact and legacy. And even people like Rosa Parks or there's a lot of history we know out of, say, um, the racial struggle in the United States in the 60s. But I think there's like thousands and thousands and thousands of people who marched that we've never even heard of. Right. And if they hadn't participated, there would have been no transformation. Correct. And I'm not- Because Martin Luther by himself was just a guy. Right. Yeah, we have to have these catalytic leaders in yeah. society. Yeah. But we're not all going to be catalytic leaders. And I think that's my point is like, you could be listening and be like, well, there's no way I'm ever going to be a Dorothy Day or Martin Luther King. So I don't know. It's interesting to think about, but we're not going to do anything. And I just think, no, we got to find a way to show up and I, I think and I, use I, our power. Yeah, I want to push back against philosophizing and doing nothing. Hmm. Because I, I think as Christians, we can get really good at philosophizing about what we believe in and what we think about. And I think the world knows this about us. This is why they call us hypocrites. We can sit around and philosophize about, yes, this idea of um, nonviolent resistance. But, like, we, we actually haven't done the pre-work of saying, what would I resist? Right. And I think the question is, we have to... And I don't think we have to all resist everything. Right. Because you'd be... Uh, you'd, you'd be... Losing your marbles. Right. Cause you, but pick one thing. At least one thing. Yeah. You can pick one or two or set, like, depending right. on the kind of person you are. But I think we all are called, this is an example of practicing kingdom theology mm-hmm. in our uh, everyday lives. Yeah. So that's an interesting question then. What does obedience look like in the moment? Right. You know, so 
nobody's going to come and knock on your door and ask you if you want to be a pacifist and participate in nonviolent resistance. Like, you're going to have to be aware. If you do get that question, (laughs) do not answer. (laughs) Just close the door right away. That is a weird person. Yes. So, but we have to think then, okay, well, how do we participate? How do we um, take seriously our call to the nonviolent resistance in society? And I think some of that is going to have to be how we respond in the face of injustices, like uh, thinking about, here's a small thing, okay? You and I are both female preachers. We are. And maybe I thought when I started preaching in 1991. I I was much later for me. (laughs) Because you're much much younger. younger. Yeah, so when I started preaching, I knew there was going to be an uphill curve. And then when I finally decided to get ordained, I knew that was like a... You know, I'm like the one woman getting ordained with all the guys. And and then I'm trying to get, um, you know, my voice out there or whatever as a preacher. There was some struggle. Now, we've seen a hinge in neo-conservatism um, conservatism in the church today. Like, it's a, there's an upswing that's sort of frightening against women again it is bad exegesis if you'd like us to talk about this yeah we we can write us and we'll do a bonus episode yeah exactly but you and i have had some awkward moments you had one fairly recently yeah do you want to talk about how do you respond to a type of violence right so violence with words for sure and uh, i i had i had preached on a sunday morning like i generally always do and this is within the last few months. Right. I had somebody just chase me right down. I was I was going to go into our foyer, and someone chased me right down and screamed at me in the foyer, uh, how could you be, you are in um, rebellion to your husband and to the word of God, and how could you even call yourself a Christian screaming at me? And I, uh, I would love to tell you that naturally... <laughs> I am a docile, peace-loving person, <laughs> but I'm not. And I wanted to... Oh, The I, fire started to oh, burn. Oh, I, I could feel it. I could feel it in my ears. I could feel it here ringing in my ears. And I thought, I can respond tersely or I can respond with grace. And I just said to the lady, and this, I mean, I I have to give this caveat. This is not my natural reaction. My natural reaction would be to blow her out of the water, quote scriptures, and... Right, put her in her place. And make her feel small. Right. But I just felt like the Lord just speaking to me in that moment just to say, I'm really sorry this was a bad experience for you. You know, we would just welcome you. There's a great... I knew that there was a great church that would never have a woman speaker and I just said to her, this, this might be a better fit for you. Yeah. And the funny thing was, I, I said it very softly. And she, she obviously was looking for a fight. Because I think oftentimes the world or like people in general are looking for fights. And she said, how dare you say that to me? And I just said, I am so sorry if you felt like I was. And I, I'm not telling this story to like laud myself. This was Right. But difficult. it's a real life context. Yeah. And I think it's small things. Like this, that we say to ourselves, we actually can engage in nonviolent resistance towards right. things of power. Right. Uh, there's a Dorothy Day quote that I love, and she said it this way. People say, what is the sense of our small effort? They cannot see that we must lay one brick at a time, take one step at a time. A pebble cast into a pond causes ripples that spread in all directions. Each one of our thoughts, words, and deeds is like that. No one has a right to sit down and feel hopeless. There's too much work to do. And I do love that quote because I think it reminds us that, I mean, I wasn't changing the world. And in fact, I was talking to somebody who loved God. Like not, I wasn't even confronting the world's power. Right. But I think every chance we have to respond is a chance to build one brick at a time, right. the kingdom of God. Right, and it's a way you're challenged in that moment. How do you respond like Jesus? Right. How do you do like blessed are the peacemakers right then? How do you turn the other cheek right then? So she wasn't striking you with fists, but she was striking you with her words. Loud and ones. And I thought, you know, I, we talked about it afterward, and I was like, Jesse, you responded really well. Like, that's the way of Christ. She could see growth in my life. Yeah, I could. Well, I just know 
how hard it is when you're attacked like that. And it's the reason I know how hard it is because I have also experienced those things. Right. Now, there's a bajillion other things that are not personal, but we see them. We observe them. And how do we, in a similar way, leverage our small response Mm -hmm. or an opposite spirit? Because it is not, passivism is not a euphemism for closing your eyes. Right. No, it's not. It's not a euphemism for saying like I didn't tell that lady it was okay how she talked to me. I didn't tell her that I thought her theology was correct because I didn't. Right. But real pacifism means that we actually, with kindness confront. and with gentleness, confront truth yeah. to power. And it might not even always be kind, but it no, will I have a. It, po- but it'll it have always- a posture of love. No, I think it always can be kind. Yeah, but like kind can sound like No, kind I think you're defining kind incorrectly. Like kind, I'm if I if you're if you're out and your fly is down. <laughs> like last week. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't tell I me. Didn't, I couldn't. <laughs> it was so um, bad. The lady that we were buying something from. She told me. Okay, but I would have told you. I would okay, have told thanks you. Thanks for bringing that up on the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I all I'm saying is like, I, I think we define kind as soft. Right. And kindness is not always soft. But but kindness, like, how we define kindness is the trajectory forward. Right. So, like, I think I'm being kind to my children when I say to them, you are going up to your rooms right now to think about how you have behaved. Right. That is a kindness to them because when they sure. become adults, they won't be people that everybody rolls their eyes at. Yeah. That is my prayer, at least. Children, listen to my podcast. She started talking about her kids, and her hands got in motion, like right, true. fierce mom my, mode. Yes. Listen, here is a different example. What about, I'm borrowing a Canadian example, and there's lots of people that listen to the podcast who aren't Canadians, so you can go Google this, and you'll understand better what we're talking about. But we had a process in Canada called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, mm-hmm. and this was to get at uh, all kinds of injustices that have been uh, perpetrated against our indigenous people in Canada. Mm-hmm. It's very, very serious. And then there was a long investigation and then the report was written. And like, I can't even tell you how often I ask Christians, have you read the TRC report? And what are you doing in terms of the recommendations for action? Mm-hmm. Um, like pick something, pick one or two or three yeah, or and- five things you can do. And I think it's related to that Dorothy Day quote. We often feel like overwhelmed. Right. I, I don't actually think people are just in their own world. I right. think we feel overwhelmed by what we should do. So we, but I'm, that's why I'm saying, yeah. do one small thing. And if you don't know what that one small thing is, go read the report and pick out of their recommendations one small thing. Teach that one small thing to your kids. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, that one small thing became five small things because maybe you got four kids. And on and on it goes, right? Brick by brick, we build the kingdom. And you don't have to have a a bumper sticker that says, I am a pacifist. Right. I am a nonviolent resistor. Right. Maybe it's writing a letter to a politician. Maybe it's getting involved with Freedom Sunday, with the International Justice Mission, like... But there is ways that we begin to push back against systemic injustice or power that is damaging to others by leveraging that small bit that we can do. And it doesn't come with the same spirit. I think, to me, that's uh, almost the essential ingredient for pacifism or nonviolent resistance is that what you respond with is not got the same ingredients as the violence and the injustice and the abuse of power. Yeah, and I I do think that there is an awakening of the spirit to this kind of thing in people's lives. Like I had a young adult come and talk to me, really sharp young girl come and talk to me yesterday, and she said, I went to um, a costume party and somebody was dressed in blackface. Mm. And she said, "I, I, I need to know how to confront things like that in a way that is kind but firm. Right. And I just think, ah, oh, yeah, that's that's actually the kingdom of God bearing fruit in our lives when we when we care about on the ground things. Right. Like these and there's kinds an of example matter. of something that's just surfaced quite largely in the Canadian political arena because yeah. of our prime minister wearing blackface like 20 years ago and then now getting called out for it. But there's lots of things. There's rude jokes, there's racism, 
There's innuendos in the workplace where we just overlook, we don't speak, we don't respond, we, we laugh. Right. It's not funny. We don't want to be laughing. We don't have to look like prudes or, um, I don't know, be the weirdos. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes we are going to have to stick out and that's what we don't want to do. We don't want to have to be the person who speaks to it. We're just hoping someone else will come along. And I think my great encouragement to myself is to not take a back seat, to not put my feet up, to not become apathetic. Right. In the face of whatever abuse of power we see around us. Yeah. And I, and I think the thing with nonviolent resistance is that it's actually not impossible. We're mm-hmm. not saying start a movement of thousands of people. It's not impossible to today say to the Lord, would you give me an opportunity to right. turn the other cheek? Would you give me an opportunity to walk as a peacemaker, right? Would you give me the opportunity to confront in love, um, injustice? To to respond somehow in an opposite spirit. Yeah. And I think this, this actually becomes a guardrail for us in a lot of ways in a, in a culture that is very, very aggressive. Mm. I think most of the cultures we live in, most of the places and spaces we live in are aggressive and nonviolent resistance allows us to at some level be listeners be better yeah. listeners and respond it's, more appropriately i think it also keeps us from a hardened heart yeah it's the thing that's going to keep us soft to people and to the holy spirit when we ask the lord i mean this is the prayer i always teach everybody and everybody pray this prayer many times a day give me eyes to see ears to hear and a heart to obey or mm-hmm. respond And again, this is the thing that's going to come out over and over again is that God will give us eyes to see. He will give us ears that hear what we didn't hear before. And then we have to have spirit-inspired action or words or whatever comes in that context. But that keeps us from a hard heart because otherwise it's pretty easy to get eroded by all the aggression, all the bad news, all the angry people, all the road rage. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, I think when we're talking about um, pacifism, we actually have to talk about the backside of it too, because I mm. think sometimes you meet people that are like very committed to their pacifism and they're actually aggressive towards people that are not. Right. And they become... they're, not, they're not passive actually at all. No, and I, I think you can be a kind of... A bully? Yes. Right. And I think we probably, you can probably identify with what I'm talking about. We've all met people mm. who are bullies about their nonviolent resistance. Yes. And then you think, so I, I don't, I think we just have to, just like in everything, there's two sides of ditch, right? What we want to be mm. is somewhere going down the center. And I think if we're not aware of the two sides of ditch, though, we become difficult to be around. Yeah. Because we've married ourselves to a soapbox or to, and I think what we have to always remember is that we are married in spirit to the Lord, like yeah. to Jesus. We, yeah. we want to be people who are not, not um, one trick pony people. Yep. Is that a saying? I don't know. I'm terrible you get at sayings. sayings all Do you know, wrong. the thing is, what what's fun about this podcast <laughs> is that even if you don't like what we're talking about, you could play like a Where's Waldo game and here's how the game goes. <laughs> You listen to each episode and you listen to what sayings I said that were incorrect and weird. And it's like a word search. Yeah. And you'll always know it's Jess talking, not me. Some people have said they can't tell who's who. Um, This is Joyce talking right now. Making fun of me. (laughs) Yeah. And I feel like I do that for your enjoyment. So there you go. All right. So more thinking about nonviolent resistance. Feel free to write in to us. Um, You can message us or you can email. I think what I'd really like to hear is like different different avenues where right. we can how have, are you practicing this yeah nonviolent resistance what and, ideas have come to mind or what are the ways that you're actioning uh because i think sometimes uh the holy spirit has awakened people to things that nobody else is thinking about mm-hmm. and maybe that's your gift to the body yeah it could be provoking for our wider down-to-earth community so go ahead tell us what you think Hey, thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram or go to our website at www.downtoearthpodcast.com. 
Feel free to leave us a review wherever you find your podcasts and spread the word. Bye.